Good morning. I'm William Cheung, uh, Director of the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, second IOF webinar. Um, the title of the webinar is uh, To a Sustainable Resilience and Just Food Systems and the Role of Aquatic Foods. Uh, so before I pass uh, the mic to uh, Dr. Colette's uh, webinar for a formal start and introductions of the webinar, I would just want to, first of all, thank Colette and um, Catherine came for all their works in organizing this webinar. And also on behalf of the IOF, I'm very grateful for all the panelists for the time and participation um, and the willingness to share their perspective uh, on this uh, important topic about uh, sustainable uh, and just food system. I also want to thank uh, Allocating and uh, Megan Effort for the help in moderating this event uh, later uh, in this section. And I also want to extend uh, my th thank to all of you for joining this webinar. I look forward to a lively discussion for all of you, with all of you uh, later. And I will pass uh, the mic to Colette to formally start this webinar. Thanks, Colette. Thank you very much, William, for this warm introduction and welcome everyone. It's really wonderful to see you here today. Um, I know that the fall is a really busy period time of the year, and so I'm particularly grateful um, for you to make the time to join us today. So before we get started, um, I would like to acknowledge that the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries is based on the UBC Point Grey campus, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. You may be joining us from traditional lands across British Columbia, Canada, or somewhere else in the world. And so we would like to make sure to acknowledge the owners and caretakers of those lands as well. It is important for us to understand the history that has brought us to reside as uninvited guests on these lands and for all of us to learn about our place within that history. So you can find out who the stewards of those lands are at www.native-land.ca. And I also would like to acknowledge that land acknowledgements represent only a starting point. And so I really want to invite each and every one of us to ask ourselves how we plan to take action to support and celebrate indigenous communities. Today, I personally would like to celebrate storyteller, writer, and passionate Salish food sovereignty chef, Jared Questanachen Williams. He's pictured here on the left, and you can see on these pictures that he shared with me some of the salmon he recently caught and smoked for a cultural event. He's also an eldest kitchen manager for his community of the Cowichan tribes. And I encourage you to follow him online on YouTube or Facebook for generous teachings. So I'm truly delighted to welcome you today to the webinar entitled Towards Resilient, Sustainable and Just Food Systems and the Role of Aquatic Foods. Now, that's a little bit of a mouthful as a title, and so what does it really mean? Food? Food holds a central place in my life, and I dare guess that it does in yours too. Let's be honest, food is one of the real pleasures in life. For me, growing up, food was often a defining moment in bringing family together. And then through adulthood until today, some of the most profound lessons and moments of humanity that I have experienced have been in sharing food with friends, with family, with colleagues, with strangers, on the streets, in my home, doing fieldwork on a boat somewhere across varied geographies. And so to me, it represents a true fundamental way to celebrate our diverse experiences, cultures, as well as identities, and to honor our relationship with land and waters and to appreciate the knowledge systems that underlie what we have called and understand as food. Food can be produced in ways that are really in harmony with our environment. They can be made available in a way that benefits all of us now and future generations. It can be produced and made available in ways that are profoundly just, in ways that truly honor, support, and respect traditional practice. Food, I think, can really bring people together, but food can also be used to oppress, control, and dispossess. Unfortunately, today's global food system is characterized by such injustices, 
and has led to over 800 million people going hungry globally. These growing inequalities, biodiversity loss, climate change, they're some of the threats that really present, uh, uh, like threaten our future. And so to end hunger and malnutrition, to really provide dignified livelihoods for our communities and ensure that they have control over how their food is produced, traded and consumed, transformations are needed. On September 23rd, so just recently, the first ever United Nations Food System Summit brought together representatives across a wide swath of society and sectors to set in motion some of these transformations. Blue or aquatic foods, so foods from um, rivers and our ocean, have an important role to play in those transformations and in achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Yet these foods don't really um, take a place in policy. So today, what we're going to do is touch on some of these challenges and some of the opportunities that we have to transform our food systems. And to do that, we have assembled a wonderful panel. Um, and I was going to quickly walk you through our program that involves them. So we have five panelists who will provide us with a brief pre-recorded insights on the different dimensions of what a sustainable and just food system looks like and what the role of aquatic foods are within that system. Then we have invited two um, discussants to provide their quick reflections on what they have heard. And then we will turn things over to you, the audience, um, because today we really want to engage in a lively discussion. It is indeed a very critical part of today's webinar. So, and to guide us through this exciting next hour and a half, we have invited Megan Efford and Ali Cutting to help with moderating the question part of, the, uh, of this event. Ali Cutting is a master's student at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability here at UBC. Her research focuses on the sustainability of small-scale fisheries along the Pacific coast of Nicaragua, paying particular attention to food and livelihood. Ali is dedicated to finding solutions that foster harmony between the ocean and the people that depend on it by looking at fisheries from social, ecological, and economic angles. Megan Effort is a PhD student at the Institute for Ocean Fisheries under the supervision of Dr. Billy Christensen. She is a member of the IUF um, Respect, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee as well, so feel free to reach out to her. Megan's PhD research project is designed based on the needs and questions of the Thriller Tooth Nation. As part of her research, Megan is conducting archaeological investigations of pre-contact Thriller Tooth diets and working with community members to gain insights into environmental stewardship in Burrard and Lit here in BC. Megan will then use these data and insights to develop an ecological model for the inlet. So welcome both Ali and, and Megan, and thanks for um, being moderators for this event. Now let me turn to our five guest panelists. First, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Michelle Tichela. She is a research scientist at Sanford Center for Ocean Solution. As an interdisciplinary, pardon me, scientist, her work focuses on the impacts of climate change on food systems, spanning the aquatic and terrestrial, as well as the ecological and human dimensions. In her current role, she coordinates the Oceans and Future Food Initiative in support of building a transdisciplinary research agenda on the role of the oceans within global food system. She's also one of the core members of the Blue Food Assessment, which she will introduce to us today. As part of the Blue Food Assessment, she co-led a paper on climate risks to aquatic food system benefits, which was published just this past month in Nature Food. Today, Michelle will talk to us about the importance of aquatic foods within our food system and highlight some of the challenges and opportunities that confront it. Then we will turn over to Dr. Rashid Sumaila, who is a University Killam Professor and Canada Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Ocean Fisheries Economics at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Rashid, Rashid's research focuses on bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fishery subsidies, marine protected areas, and illegal fisheries. And he's experienced in these topics across very, very geographies. 
Rashid in 2017 won the Volvo Environment Prize and was named a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2019. Rashid was also involved in the Blue Food Assessment and co-led a paper um, on the demand for aquatic foods across geographic and temporal scales. Today's um, talk about with Rashid, sorry, will share with us his reflections on some of the steps that are needed to achieve just and sustainable food systems. And because Rashid is in high demand, unfortunately, he will have to leave a little bit early. Next, we will turn to Tabitha Martins, um, who unfortunately cannot join us just now, but will at 10.30. Um, and she is an associate professor and indigenous scholar in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at UBC. Mm. Tabitha's research explores the processes and practices of indigenous food systems. Her current research includes how food as a discipline can operationalize the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 call for action, or to action, sorry, and the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry reports, 231 calls to justice. Her research also looks into how indigenous knowledges can be used as food literacy and the reclamation and revitalization of indigenous seed knowledges. Her recent publications have focused on how COVID-19 has affected indigenous communities and strategic policies that can be used to dismantle and rebuild the food system through the five Ds of redistribution. And these are decolonization, decarbonization, diversification, democratization, and decommodification. Today, Tabitha will share with us insights into indigenous food systems. We will then have the pleasure to turn to Dr. Deng Palomares, who is a senior scientist and project manager at the Sea Around Us here at the IOF. Um, and this project assesses the impacts of fisheries on the marine ecosystems of the world and also offers mitigating solutions to, to a range of stakeholders. She is one of the creators and the lead of Sea Life Base, a large biodiversity information system on marine organisms other than fish. And she's also the science director of the Philippine NGO Quantitative Analytics. Recently, she has collaborated with a group of experts from Lancaster University, World Fish, and Dalhousie University to develop fish nutrients. And she will have a pleasure to tell us a little bit more about that initiative in a little bit. So today, Deng will provide us with insights about the achievements and the vision for this fish nutrients tool. And last, but certainly not least, we will turn our attention to Dr. Sean Morgan, who has two decades of practitioner experience in reforming fisheries and aquaculture systems in over 20 jurisdictional, national jurisdictions. Sorry. Her work uses strong science to inform policy and reform marine value chains. She enjoys working with uh, or using fishery science and management improvements to grow producer opportunities working directly with the public and lots of private stakeholders as well as governments. In the last decade, she has, had role, she has held roles as a leader of the fisheries and markets strategy at the Waite Institute. She's also been the director of science at Fishwise and has built major um, partnerships during that time. She was also the director for seafood at SS, SCS Global Services. And as part of her work, Sean has contributed and helped develop the Marine Stewardship Council and the aquatic, uh, the aquaculture uh, stewardship council, sorry, standards. Today, Sean will provide us with an overview of recent advances in, as well as opportunities and challenges for the domain of alternative blue foods. So, as you can see, we have a truly gr wonderful group of folks here today, including all of you in the audience. And I will introduce the two discussants um, a little bit later after we have had the pleasure to view um, everyone's presentations. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to join this exciting panel today. Um, I will be sharing a few insights about the challenges that are facing the future of blue foods. And these are primarily based on work that we did as part of the blue food assessment. So the Blue Food Assessment is an international research initiative that aims to fill important knowledge gaps on the role of blue foods in global food systems now and in the future, and to propel change in the policies and practices that govern food systems. 
It is a collaboration between Stanford University, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and EAT, and is co-chaired by Beatrice Krona and Rosamund Naylor. And the BFA was organized as a series of nine papers that each covered different parts of this puzzle. So there's the nutritional contributions of blue foods, there's sustainability, uh, environmental and climate change threats, and future scenarios for demand and transformation. And five of these papers were published last month and four more are very close to publication. And overall, this initiative involved over a hundred scientists from more than 25 different institutions. And in that work, we identify different challenges that face um, blue food systems. So like other parts of the food system, ensuring that blue food systems can continue to deliver vital nutrition and employment to billions of people around the world faces numerous interconnected challenges. Um, within wild capture fisheries, overfishing and illegal unreported and unregulated practices threaten the long-term sustainability of fish stocks, while in aquaculture pollution and over application of antibiotics threaten water quality and ecosystem health. Access to aquatic resources and the benefits that they generate is uh, distributed unequally, both between and within countries. Um, and External pressures also threaten present day and future blue food production. So these include industrial, urban and agricultural pollution, which negatively affects the health uh, of uh, the healthy aquatic ecosystems on which blue food depends. And then within rivers, coastal areas and open ocean, there is substantial competition within other users for resources in space with small scale actors and indigenous peoples often um, increasingly squeezed out. Um, climate change, of course, is a large looming threat, uh, already impacting marine and freshwater ecosystems around the world. And as part of the Blue Food Assessment, I co-led the climate change paper, which quantified the risks that climate change poses to different types of blue food systems and the benefits that they provide. And for assessing this climate risk, we wanted to include the full diversity of blue food systems. So that includes marine fisheries, uh, marine aquaculture offshore, uh, coastal aquaculture that includes, for example, mussels and other bivalves, uh, freshwater fisheries on rivers and lakes, um, and also freshwater aquaculture, which ranges from land-based recirculating systems to rice and fish integrated integrative systems and everything in between. And then there's the whole realm of post-production activities that includes processing, transportation, and retail. So the impacts of climate change on blue food systems are as diverse as they are. Um, they include warming waters, changes in wind patterns and rainfall that impact the productivity and location of marine fish stocks. There's ocean acidification, which impacts coral reef and shellfish fisheries and aquaculture. Um, there's loss of sea ice, which changes marine ecosystems in the Arctic and impacts fisheries access and infrastructure. Hurricanes and sea level uh, rise are increasingly damaging infrastructure and assets, and that uh, impacts both production but also supply chains, um, including transportation. Uh, heat waves impact all parts of blue feed systems, both in the water and the people that are working on land. And then drought and flooding affect the availability for freshwater fisheries and aquaculture and can also damage infrastructure. And in, aqu in aquaculture, there is an increased risk of pest and pathogen outbreaks and impacts to feed ingredients. So in our analysis, we combined projections of all of these different climate drivers in the future with information on where people are most dependent on aquatic foods for nutrition, revenue, and jobs, and where people are most vulnerable to loss of those benefits. And we find that in many places, high climate hazards, high dependence on blue foods, and high vulnerability reinforce each other. So by 2050, many island states and countries in coastal and central Africa face very high climate risk to their blue food systems. And what stands out is that many of the countries that have contributed, that have historically contributed the most to pollution, face the lowest climate risk, um, in further increasing inequalities. And another important thing to know is that no country faces no climate risk. So the need to find solutions for climate adaptation and resilience will be shared by all. So making future blue food systems sustainable, resilient, and just in the face of a changing climate will require three things. 
rapid climate mitigation to make the magnitude of impacts more manageable, substantial investment in adapting the blue food sector to a changing climate, especially in places where the well-being of many people is tied up with the sector, and finally, transformative actions to reduce vulnerability to climate change and other shocks overall, as resilient blue foods will need to be part of resilient diets and a resilient, thriving society. Thanks. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm happy to be on this panel. and. Uh, uh, to talk about uh, important stuff about food that everybody needs. The title of my talk is Food System Transformation is Needed. Now, uh, this is the title of a paper we published, I think, last week or so. Uh, and it's about monitoring uh, as a guide to food system transformation uh, in the countdown to 2030 global goals and beyond and this is uh, this is work that uh, a huge number of scientists from many institutions is uh, undertaking is a project that is led by Jessica Fanzo of Johns Hopkins you know and um, this paper I mentioned this was co-authored by 47 of us uh, led by Jessica and it was published in Food Policy. This is where we make a few points that I would like to go through very quickly in the short time I have. Yeah, so our first point is that to achieve sustainable and just food systems, we argue that food system transformation is needed. The current food system is not working in, 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 in two ways, at least in, in the fact that there's so many people who are still uh, malnourished, who are food insecure, don't have the, the, the correct diets and nutritional diets to keep them healthy and, and, and fit for, for purpose, right? So that's one. And the second point is the goal of food system transformation is to generate uh, a future where all people have access to healthy diets, which are produced in sustainable and resilient ways and that restore nature and deliver just equitable livelihoods. So this is a very packed paragraph. And, and for us to have a food system that works for the world and everybody alive and living in the world, these are the elements we need in the food system, which the current one doesn't have, and we need to introduce through food system transformation. The project is proposing a rigorous science-based monitoring framework to support evidence-based policy making and guide public and private decisions. And also support those who want to really uh, hold decision makers to account uh, and ensure that we have a full system that works for people and for nature. So to be able to do this, this is a huge task and so, there are 27 academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, UN agencies from all over the world coming together to, do, to, to, to work on this project. And this is the big framing uh, of our project. And, and so you have here very quickly, the paper is published. You can find it in the, you can find it in food policy to, to read in more detail. Essentially, we have the drivers of food system food systems and food system change and, and uh, all the things that drive it. Uh, for example, the, the, the income growth and the income and distribution of the food, you know, that, or these are the, the drivers uh, of the food system. And in the middle here, you have what we call components of the food system. And this is made up of the food supply chains, the, 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 food, the food environment itself and the people and individuals engage in it. So this is a, a big combination of, of, of components here. And what does it do? It delivers a number of things to us, uh, food for people, nutritious food, diets, uh, healthy diets in quantity and quality. And, and, and also it, it delivers some impacts on the environment, you know, and, and, and the health of people on our economy, 
social equity and inclusion. So, so this is the full food system and all of this need to be transformed in order to ensure that we meet the sustainable development goals and that sustainability and resilience, both in the natural system and the human systems are in place. So this is a huge task if you consider the state of things currently. So, and all of this will be driven by policy action, the policies we make and the actions we take by creating an enabling environment. And all of this, to be able to do this, you need data, you have information, you've got to monitor it and make sure that it is working for the people uh, through time. So to give you a bit more, when you dig deep into uh, the outcomes uh, that I just talked about, you have diets, nutrition and health and all that it does for people and how the food system affects the environment, climate and how the climate does the same. And the livelihoods of people, the poverty level, the malnutrition level, equity, all are in here. And there are then the cross-cutting teams, such as making sure the governance system is in place to help us achieve our goals of uh, meeting people's dietary needs without harming the environment. And that's where the resilience and sustainability comes, uh, comes into play. So finally, yeah, I want to talk about why all this is important because food system livelihoods, there are so many people dependent on the food. The whole, the whole world depends on the food. We need food, everybody, even philosophers, my philosophy professor used to say, need food. So that affects everybody. But the people in the sector doing the work, I mean, there's lots of people who are involved there and, and, and there are hundreds of millions of people work as part of the food system spanning rural and urban areas, high and low income countries. No, exact numbers are difficult to find, but uh, people have made some estimates and here are a bunch of them, uh, 1.2, 1.4, 1.71. And if you take all the people that actually uh, have their livelihood through the food sector, all the dependence of the people actually any income in the food system. We're talking about about 4.5 billion people having some connection in terms of livelihood to the food system. Huge, more than more than half of the uh, of the of the world's population currently. So this is important for these people because they get their livelihood directly from that for all of us because we get our nourishment from the food system. And so we need food system transformation that will make every human being get the food they need to live their quality life, both in quantity and quality, and also whilst ensuring that the environment which, which the food system depends on is not destroyed in the process so that future generations too can have the possibility to to feed themselves uh, in the spirit of infinity fish. That's my, 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 my new book talks about. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Tabitha. Uh, I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. And I am here today to talk to you uh, about some of the principles of indigenous food systems. So I am new to Musqueam territory, but I wanna begin first by acknowledging that I am a visitor, I am a guest um, on these lands. Um, I moved to Vancouver about six weeks ago, so I'm fairly new. Uh, I come from uh, Treaty One and homeland of the Métis Nation, though my family originates further north from Treaty Five. I'm Icelandic and Cree and Irish, and my Icelandic and Cree ancestors met fishing the waters of Lake Winnipeg I very much consider like Winnipeg to be my homeland. Today, I want to talk to you about some of the principles of Indigenous food systems, and I struggled a bit with what I would share in five minutes because the concept of Indigenous food systems really refers to um, such a, a deep and robust knowledge system that we're talking about, you know, 
it occurring since time immemorial. So really almost as long as we've known that there were, was time, uh, Indigenous peoples have been in active relation to the land. Um, and so trying to sum that up into five minutes is, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, but I, I wanted to share with you um, a few points of harmony amongst uh, Indigenous food systems uh, across this country. The first and perhaps most foundational of these concepts is that Indigenous food systems are ancestral. They refer to ancestral knowledges, they refer to ancestral foods, uh, practices and processes relating to the land and the waters and all living things. Um, and so what we're talking about has more recently appeared in the literature, but has been happening within our communities since time immemorial. Indigenous food systems are hyper specific and hyper local for each nation uh, across this country. And so if you envision that, um, you know, where my territory is from in Northern Manitoba, you uh, can understand that the foods that grow there uh, are, or the foods that naturally occur there are a lot different than those that are found in, in somewhere like Vancouver. And so not just uh, the geographies are different, but Indigenous people's specific relationships to the land as it has been uh, affected through colonialism, um, those experiences have uh, impacted our food systems. Indigenous food systems are relational. And by that, I mean that from an Indigenous worldview, we understand that we are in active relation to and with all living and non-living things. So we are part of an interconnected whole and we are just one part of that. And so when we think about fishing, for example, we wanna make sure that our fishing practices enable um, the pelicans and um, other plants and animals to have access to food as well. It's not just human priorities. Indigenous food systems are also reciprocal. So they're not based on what we take or produce from the land, but rather um, what do we give to the land? And we give to the land through our active citizenship. We give to the land um, through um, our ancestral processes that really speak to our spiritual connection to the land uh, and our ceremonial connection to the land. And in thinking about that spiritual, I chose this picture of a feast. Um, this is a, a, a feast that I was part of um, in Winnipeg a number of years ago. And feasting is considered one of the highest forms of ceremony um, in my Cree culture. And there's so much that we can take away um, as a teaching of the feast. Um, one is that we should be feeding our ancestors the right foods, so foods that they would recognize. Um, another point is that in a feast, um, we invoke the spirit. And that is because we consider all living things and even non-living things to be a form of spirit. Um, and when we invoke the spirit, we invite the ancestors in, but we're also demonstrating our commitment to our relationship with the land and waters. Um, feasting is also a, a way that we care for one another. And caring and sharing um, are perhaps some of the most important values within Indigenous food systems. And that extends, again, beyond our human understandings um, to the living world around us. So we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about this in the question and answer period. But for now, um, that's a little primer. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody in this call. Now, we know that fish contains the nutrients that contribute to the recommended dietary allowance for human growth and health. What we need to know is how much of the fish caught within a country's EEZ is destined for local consumption and how much of this is required to contribute to the dietary allowance of the coastal populations that depend on this catch. A recent study by Hicks et al. that was published in Nature in 2019 used the nutrient concentration data for 350 marine fish species and the parameters obtained from the parameters that you see in this graph 
obtained from uh, the global information system on fishes, fish base. And they use the Bayesian hierarchical predictive model to predict the nutrient concentrations of fish species caught between 2010 and 2014 within their EZs. They showed in this study that over 50% of the countries included in the analysis have moderate to severe deficiency risks and that some nutrients are high in tropical fishes, for example, calcium. Uh, notably in small fishes. So in our example here, this is the graph, the map of the, the concentration of calcium of fisheries within their EZs, and the graph of the contribution of fisheries to close dietary gaps. Here we see Kiribati is one of the uh, countries above the, um, the line um, that uh, decides what the requirements, the dietary requirements are. And Kiribati apparently has 82% calcium deficiency risks, but only 1% of the fish caught within the Kiribati EEZ can actually contribute to the calcium requirement of children under five years of age. So it is important to know the composition of the catch and how much of it is destined for local consumption. Uh, it will be important to determine how much of the catch can contribute to that country's dietary requirements for human growth and health. Now, the nutrients database that uh, Hicks and Al developed has been extended to 500 species. And all of these are now fully integrated in fish base and made available in a specific tool for the extraction of nutrients data from fish base. This 500 species, the data for these 500 species were used to predict the using the Bayesian predictive model developed by Aaron McNeil of the Halsey University uh, to predict the nutrient concentrations of over 5,000 species. Now, the challenge here is to increase the number of species with empirical data for fishes, and more importantly, to include data for other marine animals, marine vertebrates, and notably marine invertebrates that are also destined for human consumption. Now, this will require for the different research, research groups working in the domain to collaborate and to include their data into one platform where all of the data can be, um, can be extracted from or used from and where the data can be harmonized. So we think that in, the, in, this, in this capacity, FishBase will have the best option. FishBase will be the best op option. Now, because fisheries catch is an element of this estimation of dietary risks, um, the fisheries caught within the EEZs of maritime countries uh, will be, as we have reconstructed in the sea around us, will be able to provide the necessary data to extend these predictions to determine which fishing sector might contribute the most to the dietary requirements of coastal communities. Because small tropical fishes were underlined or highlighted by Hicks et al. to provide the highest nutrient concentrations, and because these small fishes are normally mostly caught by artisanal and subsistence fisheries and that the catch of these sectors are destined for local consumption, then it would be desirable for countries to properly identify the catches of these fishing sectors for more accurate predictions of per capita nutritional requirements. However, note that the catches are declining worldwide, and this would have an impact on the capacity of fisheries to respond to nutritional demands. Thus, we need to have a better understanding of fisheries that would contribute to the closing of these nutritional gaps, especially in developing countries. 
So given that global fisheries catch uh, are declining, it is important that especially small fish, small pelagics like sardines and anchovies be available for direct consumption by humans instead of being used as trash fish that is being fed to farm salmon, pigs, and chickens. This is not only important because such fish often are the main or only source of animal protein for billions of people, but because it is also their main source of micronutrients. Therefore, uh, the sea around us with funds for me permitting will in the near future provide its catch data re-expressed in terms of their nutrient contents. And this will hopefully support researchers in the domain, especially those working on human nutrition at the national, regional, or global scale. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to say thanks to the IOF for this invitation to speak. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about alternative seafood. And in this talk, I'd like to propose that alternative seafood can and should be considered a blue food, regardless of whether it is produced in natural aquatic systems. And this is really based on the fact that for most of the world, seafood is primarily traded or, or valued as food versus as biodiversity or, or as wildlife. Um, and as a category, seafood also faces a really strong opposing lobby in the forms of other terrestrial meats. So what I'm putting forward here is that the, the planet as well as seafood producers may stand to gain the most by promoting traditional and alternative seafood systems together as blue food allies. So I hope that the concept of plant-based seafood is intuitively accessible um, and understood as plant protein that's textured or flavored to resemble seafood. Now, cultivated or cell-based seafood may be less familiar, and this really starts with cells that are taken from real fish or marine organisms, and those are then um, put into media-filled bioreactors. They're multiplied kind of the same way that yeast is fermented in beer, and the cells are then harvested from the reactors, and they're put through a, a, a 3D printing-like process to create physical structures that can mimic tissue. So to situate us here, um, to me, this is really the food security question that I think we're facing, which is how do we feed a growing higher income and simultaneously more food insecure global population with desirable, nutritious and sustainable protein? So what we currently know is that seafood demand is increasing rapidly. And at the same time, we can't get a lot more from capture fisheries because only 7% of global fisheries have removals that are currently below capacity. So thankfully aquaculture has been growing rapidly, but production also isn't projected to be able to keep up with demand. So let's take a quick look at how factors germane to public policy motivate consumers. And as you can see here, consumers are only weakly interested in these types of public policy goals, such as nutritious or sustainable protein. Um, these items fall right at the weekend of motivators for consumers. And perhaps not surprisingly, instead, consumers' main drivers center on desirability, taste, comfort food, quality, price, um, you know, these more common types of considerations. And what this really tells us is that consumers will need to be convinced about seafood based on highly personal and, and largely non-altruistic attributes of the, of the food itself. So to come back to our original graph, um, really the risk here is that this seafood production gap that I've been talking about in the face of rising incomes and population growth will drive up the cost of seafood. And that's likely to shift consumers away from seafood and towards more affordable, but both less nutritious and less carbon friendly uh, terrestrial meats like, like chicken, pork and beef. Okay, so this is a figure that I like a lot from Gefford et al that comes from the Blue Foods Assessment. And on the left, you can see the key impacts of aquaculture, on the right, capture fisheries, and in the center, there are overlapping impacts associated with both production systems. I'm only gonna focus on the two red circled impacts and that's because a recent life cycle assessment uh, was produced in collaboration with 
alternative protein entrepreneurs, and there's only about 100 of them world uh, in the world, sorry. And so really for the first time, this allowed um, access to these difficult to find data that in turn allowed comparison of alternative proteins with traditional proteins. And the results of this LCA showed that cultivated meat produced via renewable energy um, and that was, the, they made the, the comparable comparison um, with traditional systems, also using renewable energy, uses up to 95% uh, less uh, land compared to beef, 72% compared to pork, and 63% compared to chicken. And unfortunately, no work was done on seafood, uh, but this is still important new information. And similar but slightly lesser reductions were seen in greenhouse gas emissions. So I'd, I'd like to emphasize that reduced land in particular um, is important because it's the biggest predictor of biodiversity loss where food systems themselves are the biggest users of land. So really this is a problem that needs to be solved via food production. Um, and reducing land conversion or land use, it also simultaneously allows soils to be repurposed for carbon sequestration, um, they can be used to produce renewable energy or for habitat mitigation or, or other measures as well. So increasing yield per unit space is really important. Um, and also cultivated proteins benefits are likely to be greater than the direct benefits given here in the LCA for, for those reasons. In this slide, I've greened out the negative impacts that aren't found in alternative seafood production. Um, and as you can see, alternative seafoods really do minimize or eliminate much of the environmental and climate damage associated with traditional seafood production. And on the left here, I've identified some additional environmental and climate impacts that could be added in theory to the Gefford et al. figure, many of which are problematic or present a higher risk in traditional seafood production relative to alternative seafood. So to close, I'd like to be clear that all of these production systems will have environmental and social impacts. What's really important is finding means to compare performance using commonly monitored and quantifiable metrics. And this work is really in its infancy right now. I think it's likely that alternative seafoods are gonna face an uphill challenge to enter the market, but at least from my perspective, um, they really represent more of an ally than a threat to traditional seafood particularly relative to the powerful organized lobbies associated with traditional terrestrial meat production. So I'll leave you with these final points. Um, I'll thank you for your attention and it was, a, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Um, thank you so much, um, all the speakers for those really thought provoking presentations. Um, and now we will turn to our discussant, um, Sonia Strobo and Dr. Andrea Reed. So I'll briefly introduce them before I let them take the floor. So Sonia Strobo is co-founder and CEO of Skipper Otto, which is a community supported fishery based in Vancouver, BC, and which has 7,700 members, I'd like to pause on that number, um, and 12 full-time employees. Sonia has worked in a variety of community-based organizations, nonprofits, and is also, has also been a high school teacher for many years. She's a champion of social and environmental justice issues. She sits on the advisory committees with the Fisheries for Communities Coalition, the Local Catch Network, Slow Fish Canada, and is a fellow with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, as well as a business mentor with the forum. Sonia has been a member of community supported agriculture programs since the early 90s, and she has brought her knowledge of community supported agriculture to the family fishery, first conceiving of this idea as one of the first community supported fisheries in the world in 2008. And then after Sonia, we will turn our attention to Dr. Andrea Reed, who is a citizen of the Niska Nation, an indigenous fishery scientist and an assistant professor at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. She's helping to launch and lead the Center for Indigenous Fisheries, working to build a national and indeed an international hub for the study and protection of culturally significant fish and fisheries. Her research program adopts highly interdisciplinary and applied approaches to prove our understanding of the, inter of the complex interrelationship between fish, people, and place. 
Andrea is also a co-founder of Reparia, which is a Canadian charity that connects diverse young women with science on the water to grow the next generation of water protectors. She's a National Geographic Explorer and a fellow of the Explorers Club. So welcome you both. And Sonia, please take it away with a few reflections on the presentations. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I just found this fascinating. I've been uh, taking pages of notes and, and just what an honor and a delight to be here and to, to just listen to all of you, um, really highlighting a lot of the things that we've been thinking about here at Skiparado for the last you know couple of decades, really. Um, you know, and a lot of the things that really stood out for me was thinking about um, food systems as, uh, as, as, as not these sort of um, uh, distant from humans, right? That these are really about the interconnectedness of people and place, culture and communities and, and, and this interconnectedness of people and, and, and the planet. And that's something we think a lot about at Skiparado is thinking about um, the, the very nature of a community supported fishery in our minds is that a community supported fishery is created when um, a diversity of communities of people gather together around a shared vision for what they're trying to create. And so in this case, I think what we have a shared vision for is for creating a just and sustainable food system, um, which you know out outlined so well by the speakers, it's not what we have um, and, th and that we all have a desire to produce this, to create this, to work together towards this. And from our perspective, this is really how communities come together with this shared vision to create this. They, com they contribute something to the production of that. And, and this is very different from, um, I, I think the, the, the typical economic model that we see, you know, in what all the speakers are talking about, we see um, uh, profit, uh, shareholder profit as being really the driver, the main driver for how food systems have worked. And, and how flawed that is. It's, it's utterly flawed that we could feed the world's population through some profit-based model. I think, I think of this in education as well, having been a teacher. If we think of education as a for-profit enterprise, uh, we have so many problems with this. I really uh, thought a lot when, uh, when, when Tabitha was speaking, thank you, about indigenous worldviews and indigenous perspective. And I think there's so much to be learned from applying uh, an indigenous worldview to food systems globally and how this could solve so many of the problems uh, that, that we witness in, in marine food systems and all food systems, if rather than thinking about how can we generate profits for shareholders through food, if we, if we are thinking about um, actually how do we achieve uh, this justice, this sustainable, this equitable food system that, that feeds people, uh, you know, as Dr. Samila spoke about, um, uh, you know, um, feeding people, but also uh, having livelihoods, so good livelihoods for 4.5 billion people on the planet, thinking about what are those people's lives when they like when they get up in the morning. This is all very connected to the work that we do at Skipper Auto, and Skipper Auto is, is obviously tiny on this global scale. I'm always so humbled when I hear all of you speak about your work, um, thinking about this, this the, the massive global uh, size of these problems that you're all addressing. And I'm, I'm honored and humbled to know that you're working in this space and I'm working uh, in, in, on the very grassroots small level here uh, to try to illustrate that when we, uh, when we think about food systems from a community-based perspective, we can actually create major change. And, and if we could do this in small communities everywhere in the world, I really believe we have the power to change food systems if we stop thinking of them as these massive mechanisms that have to be owned and controlled by uh, uh, some massive powers who, who are generating profit for themselves. If we stop thinking of that way and we start thinking of it locally uh, and, and, and relevant to communities, I think we have incredible power uh, for change. Um, so those are just some off the top of my head reflections. I don't wanna talk forever. I'm by no means the expert in the room. So thank you for, for having me. And, and I'm really eager to hear um, everyone else's thoughts and questions and reflections. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, and then Andrea, please, um, it's your turn. And then we'll turn over to the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, Sonia. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. I think that was 
really wonderful to see kind of all of the different lenses applied to these questions, right? Through economics, policy, indigenous food sovereignty. There's so many different ways to look at, at a fishery. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate William that you've made the, the space for these webinars to take place and, and all of the, the team, Colette, Megan, everyone, Catherine for handling all the logistics. And I feel like a little bit of a talking head because I got to play this role at the at the last webinar as well, which I'll, I'll plug in the chat um, if anyone wants to go catch it it's centered on on heat waves. And yeah, it's really an honor to get to, to speak after all of these wonderful speakers to, to share a few kind of thoughts and insights. And I really want to thank and, and welcome Tabitha to, to UBC. I'm so glad to have you here to be working in this space together it means a great deal. And I can't, I can't wait to, to meet in person. Um, but what Tabitha provided is a wonderful primer to indigenous food sovereignty. And I want to encourage people to think about these topics a little bit more. And I want to point you to the working group on indigenous food sovereignty, which is locally based. Um, and I was going to just steal a few of their words to, to share with you that they define uh, how, they, how they look at indigenous food sovereignty as a movement that is building around the world. And while there's no universal definition, it can be described as the newest and most innovative approach to achieving the end goal of long-term food security. Indigenous food sovereignty is a specific policy approach to addressing the underlying issues impacting indigenous peoples and our ability to respond to our own needs for healthy, culturally adapted indigenous foods. And I just love that interpretation and definition. Community mobilization and the maintenance of multi-millennial cultural harvesting strategies and practices provide a basis performing and influencing policy driven by practice. And they define some kind of core principles to guide this thinking. And I encourage people to go to go read and, and to check them out. Um, I also wanted to just take a minute because this was just kind of coming through my mind as I was listening to, to people speak. Um, I wanted to share a poem that I've shared with my students in the Center for Indigenous Fisheries and one that I love by uh, Nehia writer Erica Violet Lee, and it's called Bones. The bones too, eat the bones too, eat the leaves of strawberries. Do not bite the fruit off and throw the rest away as if the plant grew itself with the intention of being easier for human hands. Soft salmon vertebrae melting into my jaw like warm chalk and taking bitter green with the sweet red shifts my perception of creation entirely. This is a lesson in scarcity, abundance, and reclaiming relational nourishment from what civilization calls trash. And I was just marked by, you know, Deng's words around trash fish and really encourage people to start thinking about how we conceptualize our relationships to fish. And I love uh, my student uh, Casey's question in the chat around how we work reciprocally with the aquatic species we, we work with and study. Um, and the last plug I was going to make is to a really interesting paper uh, called Goodbye to Rough Fish that very much um, builds on, on this conversation about the language we use in these spaces and what that indicates about our relationship to these species, to these foods, um, and to ourselves. So 